Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Sabbath service. I'm excited for today's message. I'm excited um, for today just because it's the Sabbath day. Um, today is the day we get to worship God, we get to honor the Lord, and get to be here for Him. This is His day. It's not our day. It's not, you know, we get six other days we get to do what we want. But today, we get to honor the Lord. And honoring the Lord, you know, we should have that heart right now. And that's why we sing songs at the beginning, so we can get our heart prepared for the message. So that when we read the message, we can take notes of the message, we can be excited about listening to the Lord. Because this is his day. Imagine um, God, the God of the universe, the God of the, the heaven, stars, moon, and sun, um, came and sat in our house today. How would you act? If he came and sat in our house today and sat right there in a big chair, uh, you know, a nice big chair, um, he sat there and looked out at everyone, how would you act? Would you act like you don't want to be here or would you be excited and motivated? You'd be excited and motivated, right? You'd be fired up because the Lord's here. Well, guess what? The Lord is here because this is his day. It's called the Sabbath day. And so we're going to talk about that. We're going to look at that today. Um, as a matter of fact, today's message is called, Who is the Lord Jesus? Now, I know that seems like a strange message to teach at a service, at a church service or a Sabbath service, uh, but it really isn't because there's a lot of people that really don't know who the Lord actually is, don't really know the Lord. So we're going to go through that. <laughs> Everyone online, um, I've actually already emailed you the message so you can take notes. Um, you, this is going to be interactive. So you're going to want to get a pen and paper because there's a lot of blank lines on this paper. And your goal is to write down um, what the scriptures say so you can learn it for yourself. So you need to go pass this out if you don't want to take one and pass one around. It's going to be an interactive message. And this message is for you to learn. This is a foundational Bible study. Foundation means it's the foundation of what we hang our entire life on. So the life that we live is based on this message. And this message is, who is the Lord? So what we're going to be talking about today is, who is the Lord? How do we love the Lord? And how should we live today? Isn't that a pretty awesome message that God gave me today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, a, it's an empowering message, right? Of who is the Lord, how do we love the Lord, and how should we live today? So everybody, if you don't have a pen, there's some extra pens around, make sure everyone has a pen. So we're gonna be definitely taking notes. And I want you to take notes, here's why. Because your relationship is with you and the Lord. It's not with me and the Lord. See, there's a lot of people out there that go to church and they listen to the minister teach and then you do, and they do nothing. They don't even bring their Bible because they don't need to because they got the big screen up there. We have a screen here. But see, we want you to bring your Bible. We want you to you know, take notes in the scriptures. That's why we give the scriptures. So it's your message between you and the Lord. So if the Lord was sitting right here, would you take notes? Amen. Of course, if he's talking, you don't take notes, right? Well, guess what? We're going to be reading his word. So he is talking. Very important to understand. This message, one of the things about our messages that I want you to know and understand all of you here locally and online that are watching this message, because this message goes all around the world, on YouTube and on Facebook. And I don't prepare these lessons. I wake up about an hour, two hours early before the message, and I say, God, what do you want me to teach? He tells me the headline, and he tells me the scriptures. I don't read the scriptures before. I don't prepare what this message is. So when we're reading it, we're reading it at the same time. I'm learning this message just as much as you are. So this is the Lord, Jesus, talk to you, talking to you. So that's a, a mindset that we want to have. This is our website, and our ministry is called Saved by Truth Ministries. You can go to SaveByTruth.com and you can take a look at it, and there's a lot of things on there. You can see that our ministry is not just here. It's actually all around the world. We have people in India right now studying the Bible and teaching the same message. And in Africa, in different parts of Africa, in Kenya and Uganda and different parts over there, there's pastors that have their entire congregation honor the Sabbath yesterday because it was the day before. So they honor the Sabbath just like we do, and they're excited about it. Yeah. And they've been doing that now for about a year now. We taught it to them. They changed their whole day from Sunday to now honoring it based on God's calendar. So it's very important to understand that this ministry is growing exponentially. And here's the coolest part about it. It's growing with or without us. See, because this is God's plan. God's plan is to teach us the, about the kingdom of God. Yeah. So today we're going to be going through who is the Lord Jesus. Very important because if we don't know who he is, then we're not going to necessarily honor him. We definitely won't keep his day holy. We also won't, you know, reverence him. You know, I think of, you know, my life, and it's been tough in the last few weeks, and it's as far as my job is concerned, all kinds of different things. 
But the one thing I can say, my best day of the week is today, every single week. It's the best day of the week because I get to relax. I don't have to think about money. I don't have to think about work. I can leave all my burdens to God. And I get to honor him. Yeah. And so that's a mindset that you want to have, that you can honor the Lord on his day. So let's go ahead and jump right into some scriptures. Um, would someone mind getting me some water, Jim? Jaden? Would you mind some water? Yeah. Thank you. So what we're going to do is jump right into some scriptures. Uh, the way we do the Bible studies here, we look at the Bible. We look at the scriptures, and we take notes on what it says. Okay? So this, like I said, this message is between the Lord and you. Okay? So that's what you're hearing today. So let's look at the Bible, the Word of God. Um, John 1. Now this might be a basic scripture for some of us, but we're going to see what it says in a very unique way. John 1. It said, the Word became flesh. That's the title of this section. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the word was God. He was with God at the beginning. Awesome thing. We got more guests coming. This is awesome. Come on in. Come on in. Have a seat. We're starting the message right now. You came in on the first scripture. We're going to pause for 30 seconds here. So everybody can take a seat. Thank you. We're going to pause for 30 seconds so people can come in. Thank goodness for editing software. <laughs> yeah. So, what we're reading is John 1, starting in verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. So here's a few things that you got to look at here. It says, one, in the beginning. We're talking the beginning of time. The beginning of everything. The beginning of our existence. In the beginning was the Word. And it's a capital W. It means it's a personal name. And the Word was with God. So this Word was with God at the same time. And it says the Word was God at the same time. Very important basic principle. And you'll see why that's a basic principle. Because as we start going through the scriptures, it'll make a lot more sense. Um, and then it says he was with God at the beginning. So we know it's a he. I'm just going to read through the rest of it now. It says, through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that had been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does, has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He only came as a witness to the light, the true light that gives light to everyone coming into the world. He was in the world, and through the world was made, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, those who believed in his name, he gave right to become the children of God. That's a key phrase right there. I want you to make a note on your paper. It says he gave the right to become a children of God. So the one thing I want you to see here is that you have to believe in this person to have the right to become a children of God. That doesn't mean you are a child of God just because you believe in them. You get that? So just understand, that doesn't mean you are a child of God. That just means you have the right to become a child of God. Very important. Let's keep reading. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of human's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So on your line there, we're going to write down some things here um, in, in a second. It says, it says, the Word became flesh and has made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. So now we know this Word is also the Son of God, right? We know that, right? Yeah, so now we know it's the Son of God, we know it's a man, we know he was God, we know he's with God, and he's at, at the beginning. And everything was created through this person. You got that? Let's keep reading. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, 
He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in the place of grace given, already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace in truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God. This is a basic foundation principle. It says this person, not only is he the Son of God, he's also God. Very important foundational principle to understand. Look what it says. No one has ever seen God, but he's the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in the close relationship with the Father, has made him known. Okay, very important to understand that. So, who is this person? It's Jesus Christ. You see that? Now, why is this important to us? Why should this be important to us? If you think about it. Because this is who we're honoring today. So, if this person, Jesus Christ, made everything known to us, he's created the heaven and earth, should we be honoring him today? What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. That's an important thing to do, see? Because we honor a lot of things. We honor, in this world, there's, I, there's a show called Idol. American Idol? Yeah. Yeah, it's American Idol, right? And people get on stage and they clap for them. They're excited for the American Idol, right? They root for them. They text for them. They do all kinds of stuff for the American Idol. Now, how much, what does the American Idol do for you? Nothing. 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 You know, I like boxing. I go watch boxing every once in a while. I, with with uh, uh, your dad and your grandfather there. We, we love boxing. That's one of my favorite sports. And when I go, man, I get fired up. I get charged up for boxing, right? Because I can watch boxing six days a week, you know, three hours a day. I could, you know, and I get fired up about boxing. And, you know, when I'm there, I'm rooting for the guy. I'm just knock the guy out. It's exciting, right? But what do I get from that boxer? Nothing, right? But I'm excited about it. Now, I want you to think about who you're excited about, who you get enthusiastic about. When you hear a song on the radio, you get fired up about the song. When you're playing video games, you get excited about those video games. When you're watching sports and TV, you're watching boxing, you get excited and motivated. But what do they do for you? Nothing. So don't think we should have that same type of enthusiasm for the Lord? Yeah. See, that's very important as a heart because this is who we're talking about, the heaven, the God that created the heavens and the earth. Let's look at something. Let's look at a couple of things on this. Hebrews, this looks like a lot of scriptures, but I'm going to tell you, it's going to go by pretty quick because they're going to be pretty simple. And our messages, you know, are led by the Lord. We don't know how long they last, but I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to be inspired because if you take notes and you're engaged, God's going to reveal himself to you, which is exactly what we want. Let's look at Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13, it says, starting in verse 8, so, Hebrews 13, started in verse 8. And did I do something wrong here? Uh, Hebrews 13, let's try it again. Hebrews 13, where is it on Hebrews 13? Because I don't have an S there. That's why. <laughs> User error. Hebrews 13, started in verse 8. All right, then. That's not the scripture I was looking for. Yeah, it is. It is? It's what you put on the line. Oh, yes, it is. That's it is exactly right. So on that line, I want you to write in. Look what it says. It says, it says, Jesus Christ is the same, what? Yesterday. Yesterday. Today. And today. And forever. And forever. Write that down on your paper. You want to turn your phone off if you don't mind. Right. Uh, and I'm going to write a lot. Okay, good. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, so um, Jesus is the same today. What does it say? Yes, yesterday, today, and forever. Right? Yesterday, today, and forever. Very important to understand. He's the same. So this is a very important for us to get. That it's not like something new that all of a sudden Jesus just came to. Remember, he was at the beginning. But he's the same all the time, right? Okay, so let's look at that. So let's look at a couple more scriptures about the Bible. Because we've got to put our faith in, in the Word of God. Let's go 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. Three. 2 Timothy 3, starting verse 16. It says, all scripture is God-breathed. And it's useful. Key point on this. It says, all scripture is God-breathed. How much scripture is God-breathed? All. All scripture is God-breathed. Right? And it says it's useful. So <laughs> the reason why this is so important is because our Bible is not a book that we just put on the shelf. That we just have on our phone that we just have, just have this good book, right? It's useful, right? Like a cookbook is useful when? When you use it. When you actually open it and use it. Right? <laughs> a cookbook does absolutely nothing on the shelf, right? 
Yeah. And so it's very important that we got to use the Bible. But look what it says is useful. It's useful for four things for teaching. Today, we're going to be teaching you some things. The Bible is going to be teaching you how to live as a disciple. Also, rebuking. You know what rebuking is? It's a strong correction. In other words, you're going wrong. The Bible will say it with slap inside the head, like he's done me many a time, and get you back on track. The Bible will do that for you. This is also for correcting. Correcting means correction. Because there's a lot of incorrect teaching about the Bible, about who the Lord is, and everything. So it's going to correct you in the right direction. And training in righteousness. Now I train. There's a lot of football stars here in the room, right? I see that. You guys like to train, right? Just one. Just one. Oh, there's only one. Side. <laughs> well, that's, a, that's our next study on humility. <laughs> that's all other teaching. <laughs> so, but there, there are some football players. Excuse me. I'll, I'll just get over a quote here. There are some football players in the room, and a few football stars in the room. I believe they're all stars, in my opinion. But the thing about it is, you have to go train. Can you just go practice once and be excellent? No, you gotta practice how often? A lot. All the time, right? You gotta practice, you gotta commit. It has to be an intention. You can't just throw it out there and say, oh, I think I'm gonna go play football and then be on the starting lineup. Don't no, work that way here. You gotta practice that. All right, same thing here. See, because the Bible is used for training in righteousness. So if the goal is to be righteous, then we think we should train to be righteous. Yes. Yeah, when do you start training? Yeah. At practice, right? Yeah. You practice, you train at practice, but you also train at home, right? Yeah. Guess what we start training for the Sabbath day? This is training because God's here training us because we have a coach. When we go to practice, we have a coach leading us, right? Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? The Lord right now is leading you through his word. Mm -hmm. And that's what this is. This is training in righteousness. Now, if you don't want to be a good football player, you don't need to go to practice, right? Mm -hmm. But if you want to be a good football practice, let's say, because Jeremy, you go to football practice, right? If you slough off and not practice hard, what's the coach going to do? Huh? Make me, Make me run. There's going to be a consequence for slacking off the practice, right? Well, guess what? Did you know that in the Bible there's a consequence for disobedience to God too? Yeah. yeah, you're going to see that today. Because it's important for us to know that we need to know who the Lord is. Because if we don't know the Lord, then we won't know the consequence, right? Because you know your coach, right? And your coach, you know what you can get away with, what you can't, right? You know, right? Don't you know what you can get away with, you know? Because you know your coach, right? So in the same thing biblically, if we know our coach, the Lord, then we'll know what we can get away with and what we can't also. Yeah. So this is very important. Um, and here's what it says. It says, train the righteousness, here's why, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So is the goal to be thoroughly equipped or kind of halfway equipped? Yeah. Thoroughly. yeah, you want to be half good in football or basketball or sports or anything? You want to be halfway okay or do you want to be the best? Yeah, so you want to be thoroughly equipped. And so the, the Bible is useful for this to help us become thoroughly equipped. Does that make sense? Yeah, very important. Okay, so are those lines, there's some blank lines there, is those four things. It's good for teaching. Write that down. It's good for rebuking. It's good for correcting. And it's good for training in righteousness. So you want to write it down on your paper. If you're listening online, you can write it down on your paper. You can add it to the document later. But you want to write it down so you can know what the Bible is useful for. So not just this arbitrary cherry thing that we're just talking about. Something that's useful, that can be used in our life every day. Amen? Amen. Let's keep going now. We're going to look back to the beginning. Because Jesus, the Bible said that the Lord was at the beginning, right? So we're looking at the beginning. Let's look at the beginning, Genesis 1. No one Genesis, no such thing. So Genesis 1. Genesis 1, starting 1 through 13. Okay, look what it says. It says, in the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the water. God said, let there be light. And there was light. <coughs> God saw that the light was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. And the light he called day. And the darkness he called night. And there was evening. And there was morning the first day. So when God created the light in the first day, what was that light? What do you guys think it was? The sun. The sun. Pretty simple, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And then, of course, he must have created something else that day, too. Uh, what's another body up in the air that, that's another light? Mm -hmm. A moon. Yeah, pretty easy to see. So he created that on the first day, and he separated the day called day. He called the night night, right? Pretty simple. Child's play. Easy to understand. Let's keep reading. God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made this vault to separate the water under the vault from the water above it. We'll talk about that another time. Um, and it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. Now, the thing that can consist of a day is evening till morning. Evening and morning. So evening is the time before it gets dark. Morning is when the sun comes up. Night is when it's dark. Got it? So a day is evening and morning. A night is twilight and dusk. It's midnight. Get it? Very important to understand those are separate. Remember, God separated the day from the night. Very important to understand that biblical basic foundation. A day is when the sun comes up. A night is what? Sun goes down. When the sun goes down. Pretty simple. Sorry. I apologize. So, yeah, so a sun, the, the day is when the, the sun comes up, a mark, a night is when the sun goes down. Real simple. Okay? Let's keep reading. God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered in one place. Let the ground, dry, dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land, and he gathered water and called it seeds. God said that it was good. One thing I want you to see, when you see whenever he's making something, he says, let there be. Write that down. Whenever God's creating something in the beginning, he says, let there be. And then it appears. Got that? See, the God that we serve, the, the spirit that's in us when we're baptized for the forgiveness of our sin, has the same power as saying, let there be and create. See, we have the ability to create too in us. We have the ability to create good. Or we have the ability to create evil. You guys realize that? The power that's in you has the ability to create good or bad based on what the choices we make. It's our choice. Yeah. So it's very important. God chose to make these things. Let's keep reading. Verse 11, then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to the various kind. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, bearing uh, plant bearing seeds according to their kind and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kind. And God saw that it was good. And it was evening and morning the, the third day. Um, I, here's a little trick question for you. Um, you know the, the chicken with the egg um, question, right? Well, what came first, the chicken or the egg? What came first? What do you guys think? Kids, what do you guys think? Chicken. Chicken? Anybody think the egg? Oh, no, the egg came first. The egg came first? The egg came first. Egg, what do you think? Yeah, chicken, egg, chicken, egg, what? Uh, well, I'll tell you the answer. Egg. Got um, chicken. chicken. Here's why, because God didn't make eggs. He made chicken. And then the chicken <laughs> produced. <laughs> and then the chicken produced of its kind. Very important. Okay, so let's keep reading. That's your answer when other people ask that question. You know, which which came first? But anyway, God said, "Let there be lights in the vault of the sky, just um, to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs." to mark sacred times, days, and years. So this is very important. God's calendar is created of three things. Signs. And let's keep reading. Look what it says. Verse um, 15. And let the, them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights. When did he make the two great lights? In the beginning. In the beginning, day one, right? And what were the two great lights he made? Sun. Sun, Sun and the moon, pretty simple. There's a little another question for you. Is the sun a body of land or is it a light? It's a light. Well, what does the Bible say? Light. It's a light. Very important. That's why the sun is not being reflected off the sun. Uh, the moon is not being reflected off the sun. It's it's a, it's its own light. That's been proven now. But that's important to understand. But here it is. It says, and let there be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, and it was so. God made two great lights: the greater light to govern the greater light to govern the day, and the lesser light to govern the night. And He also made the stars. So write this down. This is what you put on the line. Um, um, God's calendar consists of three things. The sun, moon, and stars. And you're going to see that. Write that down on your paper. Okay. And here's the proof of it. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness. 
And God saw that it was good. And in the evening, there was morning the first day. So think about this. If I gave you a document right now that had the days, the, the sacred times or holy times, sacred times, the days and years on it, what document would that be? That would be a calendar, right? So that's the Lord's calendar. He made it at the beginning of time. Doesn't that make sense? So this is very important. That God made a calendar and he made it at the beginning of time for us. Now, why is that important for us? Well, we're going to see as the scriptures go on. So now we know what God's calendar is. Let's look at Genesis 2. Genesis 2. Starting in verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished his work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because he rested from all the work he had been created and he was done. So what day did God rest? Quick question. The seventh, day. the seventh day. Did he rest the eighth day? Did he rest the first day of the week? Did he rest any day that he wanted? No, what day did he rest? The seventh, the seventh day. What day did he bless? The seventh day. What day did he make holy? Seventh day. What day? Seventh day. Seventh day. That's right. So look at on that line here. It says, what line, um, what day did the God the God make holy? What day was it? Seven. Seventh day. So you want to write that down on your paper. Write that down on your paper. And what day did the Lord rest on? Write it on your paper. Seven. Seventh day. That's important for you to understand. So you can't say, oh, I didn't know when the seventh day was. <laughs> You can't say that any longer because God just showed you it's based on the sun, moon, and stars. That's his calendar. And he also showed you what day it is, right? So there's no more misunderstanding. We just, just cleared up the entire mayhem of this world that everybody created. Because let me ask you a question. How many Jews were around in Genesis? Don't go that way. How many Jews were around in Genesis? None. None. You get it? So it's not the Jewish calendar. Very important, I understand. How many Pope Gregory's were there around at that time? None. None. How many humans were around at that time? None is the answer. You got it? Mm. So it's not it's not a person's calendar. It's not an organization's calendar. It's not a group's calendar. It's the Lord's calendar. Amen. You got it? Amen. So we honor the Lord Amen. and his calendar. In God's perspective, at this point, there's only one calendar. Yeah. And God is the, the Lord is the same Always, right? Did yeah. we just read that? Yeah. So if it was the Lord's calendar back then, what do you think it is today? Lord's the Lord's calendar. What do you think? He'll change his calendar all of a sudden? Does that make sense? No. No. You see, these are common sense, basic foundational principles that we have to learn as disciples if we want to honor the truth. Amen. So let's keep reading. Okay, so now we're going to go over to... Um, I want to talk about a couple things real quick before I look at the scripture. We're not going to look at these scriptures. But you can read it for yourself, Genesis 9 through 17. It talks about signs. You guys probably know them. In Noah's day, he made a covenant with Noah, right? Remember, he flooded the earth and killed everyone, but some people were saved, eight people were saved on a boat. Now, what was the covenant? And what was the sign of the covenant with Noah? Who was it? A rainbow. A rainbow. Did you guys know that? Yeah, whenever you see a rainbow outside, that's a sign that God's never going to flood the earth again. And you can read it right there in the Bible. So God gave us a sign for everyone when they see that rainbow, okay, God's never going to flood the earth again like he did the first time. Isn't that awesome to know he gave us a sign like that? Mm -hmm. See, we, but if you don't know the signs, you won't know what to look for. If you're driving down the street, you know, you guys are starting to get to the age of driving, right? And you see a sign that says STOP and it's red, but you don't know what that sign means, what are you going to do? Blow right through. You're going to blow right through what's going to happen? It's going to get into an accident, and there could be some death going on, right? So if there's some signs in the Bible that God tells us to look for, we don't know those signs, what could happen? We could blow right through them, and there could be some deaths happening. Make sense? Very important to understand. These are signs. That's a sign. Okay, so let's look. So that's a covenant. A covenant, just so you know, is like a marriage covenant. Me and my wife, we got married on uh, April 28th. 2001. Yes, I remember. Got it. Like that? Bam! I get a brownie point for that one. Right? On, on cue, too. Didn't even write it down. So, um, men take note on that. Dating dates and, you know, I'm talking about, you remember that stuff because, trust me, it'll go a long way if you don't. 
<laughs> room forever. But anyway, very important. You gotta <laughs> yourself. Yeah, you gotta understand that God made a covenant, and that's called a marriage covenant. When God makes a marriage covenant with someone, that's what He's doing. So He made a marriage covenant with Noah that He was never gonna flood the earth again. You understand? That was His promise. That was called a promise. Write that down. The word promise. He made a promise to Noah that he's never flooded the earth again. Now, there's floods going on on the earth, right? Yes, there's, there's a lot of floods going on on the earth right now. But you know what? He's never flooded the earth again. So he's not going to. And he promises he won't. That's his covenant. But there's another covenant. And you can read that one. That one is in Genesis 17, verse 1 through 8. He made a covenant with Abraham. Now, you may not know that covenant, but some of you may know it. He made a covenant with Abraham and his people. He says people are going to be numerous as... The stars in the sky and plentiful as the sand on the beaches. Right? His people are going to be that many people. Right? That there are going to be that many people that are going to be so many of them around the world. And you know what another thing he said? And we can look at that another time, but it was a, a message that he gave them a, a promise that in, they're going to be enslaved for 400 years. And they're going to come out with great possession. Enslaved for 400 years. Write that down. 400 years. And I'm not going to go into that message today, but that's going to be another message on the road. They were enslaved for 400 years. Now, he's not talking about the time in Egypt because the Israelites were enslaved for 400 years back then. They were only enslaved for a little over hundreds of years. He's talking about another time period when his people are going to be enslaved for 400 years and then are going to come out with great possession. Got that? Okay. So you can read about that another time. But that's another covenant that he made with his people. That the people are going to be numerous of the stars, and they're going to go into what's called a promised what? Land. Land. A promised land. That was called the land of milk and honey. Back then it was called the land of? Canaan. Canaan. It was not called the land of Israel. It was called the land of Canaan. Very important to understand. That was his promise to his people. So now, he made other promises. He made a promise with the Israelites. So let's look at that. Let's look over in um, Genesis, uh, no, I'm sorry, Exodus 19. Exodus 19. Exodus 19. By the way, when we study the Bible, we actually study the Bible, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> we don't read two scriptures, a couple jokes, and tell a couple of, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, personal stories. We read the Bible. We let the Bible do the talking. This is the Lord's day. You understand? We let the Bible do the talking to teach us. We don't have anywhere to go because we don't work today. We have no, this is our day to honor God. Let's look at verse 19, 19, verse 1. Look what it says. It says, On the first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt. So remember the ten plagues? Do you guys remember the ten plagues in Egypt? And he, he, God sent down these plagues on the Egyptians? Do you guys know about that at all? Okay, no, we'll, we'll read about that another time. But he sent down ten plagues. He said frogs and flies and all this stuff. And then he led them through the Red Sea on dry ground, part of the Red Sea. And then they walked on dry ground. Then the flood came down and killed all the Egyptians at that time. And they were free now to come honor God. And they had been walking in the desert. This is the time period when they were walking now. They're walking to a mountain called Mount what? Sinai. Sinai. Write that down. Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai was where God made a covenant with his people. And we're going to see that right here. It says, on the first day of the third month, the Israelites left Egypt on that very day. They came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped in the desert in front of the mountain. Now, you see the word Israel there. I want to break that down real quick, because Israel are people. They're called Israelites. When the 12 tribes of Israel are together, guess what they're called? Israel. It's never a land called Israel. It were a people called Israel. So there are Israelites in this room today. You gotta to understand who the people of Israel are. So you gotta understand that's not a land. Very important. But let's keep reading. Verse 3. It says, Then Moses went up to God and the Lord called him, called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourself have been have seen what I did in Egypt. And how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, here's the key. If you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you 
will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So guess what I'm doing for you today? I'm speaking to you that same message to you. That he says that if you keep his covenant, you will be considered a treasured possession. Now, who wants to be a treasure possession? Anybody in the room want to be a treasure possession to the Lord? Yeah, yeah. Or you don't really care? You don't really care? You don't, you don't have to. Just so you know, you don't have to be a treasure possession to the Lord. You can, you can really not be one if you don't want to. That's optional. But if you want to be a treasure possession to the Lord, then this is how you become a treasure possession to the Lord. Look what it says. It says, verse 5, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you'll be my treasure possession. You notice that? So there's two requirements. One, obey him fully. Mm -hmm. Two, keep his covenant. Then you will be a treasure possession. Make sense? Yes. So it's kind of like in, in sports. I know I, I keep mentioning sports because you guys are on sports and stuff. Um, if you want to be a, a, a running back, what do you have to do? You have to do certain things, right? You have to perform a certain way to become the starting running back, right? If you want to become a lineman, what do you have to do? You have to perform a certain way and get a certain skill set to become a, a, a right that starting lineup. If you want to become a great wide receiver, what do you have to do? If you want to be a great soccer player, what do you have to do? You have to perform a certain way, and then you will get that position, right? What if you don't? What if you choose not to? And you just ah, it's no big deal. I don't care. If I get the position, I don't. If I do, I don't. What do you think is going to happen? What, do you, what will the coach say to you? No, you're going to get cut from the team. That's actually what's going to happen, right? Would you agree? If you don't perform to the standard of the coach that's coaching you, you will get cut from the team. Don't you, don't you agree? Amen. In, in sports, isn't that what happens? Yeah. You guys know sports better than I do. Yeah, that's what happens, see? And that happens in life. If you go to a job and you work a nine to five job, this is for all of you young kids, because you guys start to get into the workforce, right? If you go to a job nonchalant and act like it's no big deal, and you don't care that whatever happens, you don't participate, you don't do any of that at the job, what ends up happening with the boss sees you slack it off when everybody else is motivated? What do you do? You get fired. And then you blame the boss, say, oh, it's his fault. No, it was your choice. You get it? Mm -hmm. Very important to understand this. This is a biblical principle. These are basic foundations. So, you know, if we obey him fully and keep his covenant, then we'll be a treasured possession. And then he said he'll make us a holy nation. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. So we know exactly what to do. So let's look at what that covenant is. Because I know Pete personally, I want to be a treasured possession of the Lord. I also want to um, be a, in, under his covenant for the Lord. That's what I want. So let's look at um, Exodus 20. I'm just going to read this. Jaden probably has it by memory, but I'm going to read it anyway. Okay, first of all, who is God? The Father, right? Who is the Lord? Jesus, Jesus right? This, but they're all one. Remember, he said God is one. He said the beginning, right? So this is very important to understand who spoke these words. Look what it says. And God spoke all these words, right? Mm -hmm. I am the Lord, your God. Now, who is that? Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus. Very important. See, because a lot of people, when they study the Bible, they think, oh, God in the Old Testament, and then Jesus came to the New Testament. We only follow Jesus. Well, this is Jesus. So remember, he's the same in the beginning and the end, and the same all the time. He was there at the beginning. He created everything. Everything's created through him, right? So if he was there in the beginning, then this is Jesus. So it's very important. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. So when we're new as a disciple, you know what our slavery is? It's called sin. When you're enslaved to sin, that's your slavery. See, they were enslaved to the sin of the world, and the Israelites, they were punished by, by them. But our sin is our slavery right now. We'll do a whole other message on that another day. But this is very important. And he is the same person who brings us out of our slavery. And you'll see that. So here is the covenant. Who would like to know what the covenant of God is? Because how do you honor a covenant if you don't know what it is? It's kind of hard to do that, right? Mm -hmm. So let's look at it. You shall not have any other God, no other gods before me. So if you put anything in front of God that's more important than God, then that's your God. You guys realize that? Let me say that again, just in case it wasn't clear. If you put anything in front of God that's more important than God, then that is your God. 
That could be your life. That could be your school. That could be your job. That could be your business. That could be your spouse. That could be your wife, your girlfriend. That could be your life. That could be your dreams and hopes. That could be your career. That could be your sports. That could be anything. Anything you put in front of God that's more important than God is your God. And God says, you shall not have any other God before me. So that kind of nails that down for you, right? Okay, so let's keep reading now. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything, in heaven above or in earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down and worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children to the sins of the parents, to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. So who does God show love to? Who does God show love to? Those who obey his commandments, right? To the children. To the yeah. So it's very important. Let's keep reading. You should not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you should not, not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, your male or female servant, or your animals or your foreigners residing in your town. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that are in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and mother, so that it may um, so that you may live long in the land your Lord, your God has given you. That's another important thing that we need to talk about, is honoring our parents, our father and mother. Yeah, because for a long time, for years, I didn't honor my mother and father. I know my dad wasn't there for me for a long time, and I didn't honor my dad. I had to learn how to honor my dad. I had to learn how to respect my mom, because, you know, she was my mom, and I used to run a bucket as a young kid. I ran around. I, I mean, I was out till wee hours of the night almost all the time. Almost all the time, she, she worked the graveyard shift. So, you know, she left me by myself the whole night, and I was gone. You understand? But was that honoring my mom? No. No, I definitely did not honor my mom. But now I, I've learned to honor my mom. And that's something that we have to all learn how to do, is honor our mother and father. Let's keep reading. You shall not burn it. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You, you shall not cover your neighbor's wife or your male or female donkey, or your ox, um, ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Just so you know what covet means, it means that you desire it. Like if they have a nice car and you decide, man, I really want that car. That's covetedness. So these are the things that the Bible says that we need to do to be under his covenant. Now, here's the coolest part about that. It's optional. We don't have to choose to do it. But then we can't call ourselves the child of God either. You understand? Very important. This is very important to the Lord. We can call ourselves anything we want. I mean, I can call myself a professional football player, and I can call myself beating Jaden in track and, and running. I can say that, right, Jaden? But what is the reality? I can't beat my daughter in running. My legs are all too old. I'm too heavy. I'm, I can't run. <laughs> Make it happen. No matter how much I mentally believe I think it can happen. Because I believe it. Sometimes I go to the gym on that treadmill, and I'm walking, I'm jogging a little bit, and I'm doing my little jog. And I'm, and I'm on the stairmaster, and I'm like, man, I can get her now. And then I get off, and then reality kicks in, because I can't walk down the stairs because I'm tired. <laughs> so, so, you know, reality, and we got to be real with ourselves, is that we're not honoring God. We're not right with God. Very important. So let's look. So, the Lord, our God. On the blank line there, it says the Lord, our God. You want to write that down. The Lord our God. Now, the, the Lord is Jesus. We know that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's write that down on that paper. The Lord our God, so you know who you're talking to. So there's no misunderstanding of who the Lord is. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at Exodus again. We're going to look at some more things about Exodus. Because out of those different Ten Commandments, which were the covenant, did you notice one of them was a little different? Remember that game, one of these things do not belong to you? <laughs> so the, the older he, he did, no, the younger was probably you know, that was a cartoon back in the day. One of these things do not belong here. It was a TV show and they had like four different things and one of them was an orange, all the rest were apples, and we had to figure out which one wasn't. That's how I mean you guys got like Xbox now. I mean we had so silly games like that. But like, yeah, jump rope. Stuff like that. Some simple stuff. But one of those Ten Commandments was different than the other. And one thing that made it different, it said remember. See, all the other Ten Commandments saying, don't do this. 
But there's one that said remember. And that was which one? Uh-huh. Remember the seventh day by keeping it holy. Right? Mm-hmm. Very important. Not remember the Sabbath. Because people can get mixed up with that. The Sabbath is the name of the seventh day. So he said remember the seventh day by keeping it holy. Got that? So let's look at that. Let's look at Exodus 31. Exodus 31. Because this is very important of why we do what we do. We want to make sure we understand why. Let's look. Then the Lord said to Moses, say to the Israelites, you must observe my Sabbath. Is it optional? No. Um, well, it is optional. You don't have to. But not if you're God's people. Mm-hmm. Then it's must mandatory. <laughs> you get it? If you, you don't have to go to practice as, 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 as football, right? Well, you don't have to go to soccer practice, do you? No. But don't expect to play the game either. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? You don't expect to be on the team very long if you choose not to go to practice. So that's all it's saying. So what it says here, the Lord says to Moses, say to the Israelites, you must observe my Sabbath. This will be a sign between me and you for the generations to come, so that you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. So the Bible just said that the Sabbath is a sign between God and his people. It's a sign. What's a sign? It's like a mark, right? It's like a brand. You know, you got uh, logos, like a little swish. If I had a swish on my sweater, what would that be? What company would that be? Nike, how do you guys know that? Because they have a mark, right? That's the mark that brands that sweater, right? And you know it. If I have three lines, straight lines on my shoes, what kind of shoes are those? How do you know that? Isn't that amazing? You guys know brands like nobody's business. And you know those brands, right? Well, what is the brand of God? It's keeping the Sabbath day home. That's how he knows his people. Because around the world right now, how many people around the world today, on this day, now, no, today is the unique day because it happens to be Saturday. There's a lot of people that might be honoring God today. But when this changes next week and it's on Monday, how many people do you think are going to be honoring the Lord that day? Very few. There's a reason. That's a deception that Satan has had. You understand? But see, God right now is bringing his covenant and teaching you this so you can stand out from the rest of the competition. You understand? He wants you to stand out from the rest of the people in the world. He's looking for the people that want to honor him, and he's pulling them out, and he's sitting them over here, and the sign of those people is the Sabbath day. That's the sign. That's the mark. That's how he knows who is his people. You get it? And you're going to see why that's important a little bit later. Let's keep reading. Verse 14. Observe the Sabbath day because it's holy to you. So we should be honored because it should be holy to you. See, it shouldn't just be holy to me. I should be the most excited person in the room. You should be. You should be fired up to this day because you get to rest. You get to relax. You get to honor the Lord. You get to be with the God of heaven and earth today. And so you get to. You don't have to. You get to be with the Lord. This is a big difference in that mindset. See, if you feel like you have to be here, this is a problem in your heart. You need to check that out. Amen. You understand? You need to ask the question, I get to be here. This is a privilege. Because you don't have to. You can go be in the world. And you'll suffer the consequences of that. You understand? Or you get to be with the Lord. Yeah. It's a privilege. This is a, I mean, there's nothing better. The Lord was sitting right here right now, and I you get to go sit at his feet. That's what you're doing on the Sabbath day. He's here right now teaching you this message. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's an attitude that we have to have. Look what it says. Verse 15. Verse 14. Observe the Sabbath because it is holy to you. Anyone who desecrates it is to be put to death. Those who do any work on that day must be cut off from their people. For six days work is to be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day is to be put to death. Now, back in those days, they used to get stoned immediately. There's a book in Numbers 15, this guy would not got wood on the Sabbath day. And back then they were under the law. So the law, they didn't have grace. Grace means you get time to change and repent. That's what grace is. We get the opportunity to repent. That's why Jesus came to give us the opportunity to change. But see, back then they didn't have that. They had the law. And guess what? This guy took some wood and decided to go work on the Sabbath day. He got stoned that day. Imagine if Jesus came and he said, I'm going to change it. I'm going to put it back like that now. And you break the Sabbath day, you get stoned that day. How many people would break the Sabbath day? It'd be a lot less people breaking it, right? Yeah, see, when he gives us freedom, he gives us the heart to want to be there. 
And that's what he's really looking for, is the people that want to honor him, not that have to. See? See the heart? Yeah. Very important. But look what it says. Verse 16, the Israelites are to observe the Sabbath, celebrating it for generating generations to come as a lasting covenant. It will be a sign between me and the Israelites for how long? What does it say? Forever. Not until Jesus comes and nailed on the cross, because this is Jesus that's teaching it. Forever. This is the sign between God and his people. Look what it says. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, and the seventh day he rested and it was refreshed. When the Lord finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave them two stone tablets, the covenant law, the tablets of stone inscribed by the finger of God. What was put on the stone, two stone tablets? The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are the sign between God and his people. And the Sabbath day is the specific sign. Because some people don't murder. That doesn't mean they're part of that, that plan. Does that make sense? Very important to understand that. So what is the sign of God's, um, God's covenant? Sabbath. What is it? Sabbath. Sabbath day. There you go. Let's keep reading. So this is how we love the Lord. Uh, we must love the Lord, and um, they should be on our hearts. So let's read. Where am I at? Uh, actually, I think I took off the scripture by accident. Let's go to, oh, actually, I didn't have the scripture on there. Write the scripture down. I just noticed it's not on there. I, I deleted it by accident. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6. See, when you get a shirt and you want to impress um, the mark of Nike on it, what do you do? You got to put heat on it. You got to iron it on there, right? And then it sticks on it so that when it's on the shoe, it's there. When it's on the shirt, it's there. When it goes through washing, it's still there. No matter how many times you wash the sweaters, the Nike logo is still there, right? Right, because it's impressed. Got it? That's called impression. It's an impression in there. Make sense? Let's look at what the Bible says. I'm going to actually change the... Uh, the translation on this one because sometimes different it reads differently in different translations so i'm going to change it to what's called the new king james version just because the translation it reads a little better sorry about that let's try it this way it reads a little better in this one that's why i use this program called bible gateway i can change the translation pretty easily easily look what it says now this is the commandment and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded you to teach, that you may observe them in the land you are crossing over to, to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God and keep his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, and your sons and your grandsons and all the days of your life, that your days be prolonged. Therefore, hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may do well with you, and that you may multiply greatly in the Lord your God the Father has promised you in the land flowing with Canaan. Okay? Look what it says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. So the number one thing we have to do is love the Lord your God with all your heart. What does it look like to love the God with all your heart? What would that look like? Give me an example of what that would look like. Your life would be lived according to his word. Yeah, would you be excited about the Lord? Mm -hmm. Yeah, would you be motivated? Would you want to say you are? Right. You'd be, you know, that's loving the Lord. Look what it says. And it should be on your heart. Let's keep reading what it says there. Look what it says. This is cool. And these words which I command you today shall be on your hearts. And you shall teach them diligently to your children. You should talk about them when you sit in the house, when you walk them on the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You should bind them as a sign on your hand, and they should be a frontless between your eyes. You should write them on the doorpost of your house and of your gates. So this sign is to be on your hand and on your front of your eyes. But let me look at it in the NIV again. I'm going to show you real quick, just so you can see it. Okay. So let's read right here again. Verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. These commandments, ten commandments, I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Remember when we talk about impressing? So what should we be impressing on our children? Let me, let me ask that again. What should we be impressing on the children? The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, right? Right. You notice it doesn't say impress 
all your math, math and reading on there doesn't say all math, uh, impress your schoolwork on there, impress any of that type of stuff. Now, do we have to do schoolwork? Of course we do. But what God wants us to impress on us over everything else is the Ten Commandments. Well, ask yourself the question, when is the last time I read the Ten Commandments to my children? Ask that question to yourself. You watch it online. Ask the question. When is the last time I physically read it to my kids? And you, that are adult, of adult age, when is the last time I physically even read it? Well, if this is what he tells us is the sign between God and his people, he tells us to impress it on our children, do you think it's important for us to read it and know what it is? Yes. Of course it is. Let's keep reading. Verse 7. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. So look what it says on the paper, verse letter D. It says, talk about them when. How often does it say we should be talking about these Ten Commandments? How often should we be talking about this? Well, look what it says. When you're at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. So the Bible says we should be talking about the Ten Commandments all the time. Here's the question. When's the last time you've been talking about it? Yeah, see, it's important to understand that. We don't talk about this. This is not even talked about or discussed. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, yes. This is not even discussed in the world that much, right? Not even discussed. Matter of fact, it's being taken out of the schools. It's being taken out of the government. They're knocking down Ten Commandments all around the country. You know why? Because they're getting away from God's covenant. Yeah. You understand? Well, and, and Satan is the God of this world. God wants us to be under his covenant. Look what it says. It says, verse 8, tie them as a symbol on your hands and bind them on your forehead. Write that down. We'll do another study on this today, another day, but it says bind them on your hand and on your forehead. There's only one other thing in the entire Bible in the book of Revelation that gets bound on our hand and on our forehead. What is that? The mark of the beast. The mark of the beast. Isn't that interesting? So in the book of Revelation, the Bible says that there's going to be a mark on our hand and on our forehead. The Bible says keep the commandments on our hand and on our forehead. So what do you think the mark of the beast is? Let's keep it real simple. It's disobedience to the commandments, mm -hmm. especially the Sabbath day. And you'll understand that. We'll do a whole other message on that another day. Very simple. But let's keep reading. Let's go. Because this is very important. Because as you're reading this, you're seeing that the God wants his people. Now, remember, we're talking about God's people, right? So let's go to Deuteronomy 8. Deuteronomy 8. Now, this title, Do Not Forget the Lord. Sorry for everybody having to go under the table. I didn't think about that. Didn't leave enough space for you guys. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> okay, so look what it says. Deuteronomy 8, starting verse 1 through 19. It says, be careful to follow every command I'm giving you today, so that you may live and increase and may enter to possess the land the Lord promised from oath to your ancestors. What land was that? The promised land. That was called the promised land. Write that down. The goal of God is to take his people into the promised land. Today, what do we call the promised land? Heaven. Heaven. Right. So the goal back then was to walk them into the promised land. The goal today is the same goal, to walk his people into the promised land, right? But they didn't go into the promised land. You know why they didn't go into the promised land? Because they were disobedient to the commandments. And you're going to see that right now. Verse 2, remember how the Lord, your God, led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to, you, in order to know what, your heart, what was in your heart whether or not you will keep his commandments. Wow. So the Lord tested the Israelites around the desert for 40 years to see if they would be willing to obey his commandments. And they failed the test. So they've been humbled for 4,000 years now. That's why our people have been suffering as long as they have. Because we disobeyed our parents. Remember he said, I'm going to punish the children to the third and fourth generation to those who hate me. That's what our family did. Our grandparents did that to us because they were disobedient to the commandments. See, but the Lord now is bringing us back under cover. He wants us to get back to it. He's giving you the opportunity to learn it again. It's your opportunity again. Look what it says, verse um, 3. He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feed you with manna, 
what the neither your nor, nor your um, ancestors had known to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out, and your feet did not swell during those 40 years. Know then in your heart that a man disciplines the son. The Lord your God disciplines you. Observe the commands of the Lord your God. Walk in obedience to him and reverence to him. I want to stop there. He says, not only do we walk in obedience to him, how else should we walk? In reverence to him. You know what reverence means? In awe. Mm -hmm. You know how you see those, those celebrities and people are in awe? Wow. People will stand outside for days on end to go to a Michael Jackson concert. Mm -hmm. Right? They'll go buy tickets for a thousand bucks just to sit up front to go watch a baseball game. People will sit, you know, do everything they could to go honor these people but then when it comes to the Lord, they don't even act like they even want to be there to honor the Lord. That's not reverence to God. Reverence to God is having that heart to want to be with the Lord every day. Because that's a privilege. Let's keep reading. Verse 7. For the Lord your God is bringing you into the good land, a land with brooks and streams, and deep springs gushing out into the valley of the hills. A land with wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, olive oil and honey. A land where bread will not be scarce, but we will lack nothing. Isn't that awesome to know that God's going to bring us into a land that we lack nothing? Mm -hmm. We don't have to be struggling and stuff that we go through today. He's going to bring us into that land. Isn't that an awesome feeling? Yeah. It's an awesome feeling, isn't it? Yeah. Look what it says. A land where the rocks and iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the land, good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commandments, his laws, and his decrees. I am giving you this day. Otherwise, here's why. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have multiplied, then your hearts will become proud and you will forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt in the land of slavery. Wow. This is why we honor the Lord every week on the Sabbath day. So we don't ever forget the Lord. That's why every month we're going to go out and look at the new moon, which we're going to do tomorrow. So that every month we're looking at his creation every month. We're in awe every month. Every week we're honoring his, his day, his week. You understand? Every feast day we're honoring his feast day. Because, so we don't forget the Lord. Because then our money becomes our God. Our careers become our God. Our school becomes our God. Or something else becomes our God. Something else will become your God. If you don't put God first. And he wants to bring you into the promised land. That's his goal. He wants to. Let's keep reading. Verse 15. He led you through the vast and dreadful wilderness, that thirsty and waterless land, with villainous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of a rock. He gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors had never known, to humble and test you that in the end might go well with you. You may say to yourself, my power and strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember, the Lord your God, it is he who gives the ability to produce wealth. Yeah. And so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. See, when we go out and work and we generate money and we generate wealth and we accumulate all this stuff, who will we give a praise to? When we're, we got our skill sets, we got our talents, who do we give praise to? When we have our life and we have our family, we have whatever we have, or we have nothing, who do we give praise to? We need to be giving praise to the Lord because yeah. he gave it. He gave you the ability to produce it. Mm -hmm. So that's the heart we need to have. I don't see that heart right now in this world. No. I don't see that hard that, that much in this world. It's all about what I did. Me, I'm the best. I can do this. I can do that. It ain't about you. You understand? The Lord did it. And you should be thanking him for it. Let's go. Let's keep reading. So how should we live today? I'm going to wrap this up. How should we live today? Hebrews. Hebrews 4. Because I've had people say, well, you know, that's the Old Testament, Stephen. Well, it's really not an Old Testament because there's no such thing as Old Testament in the Bible. The Bible said all scripture is God-breathed. Old Testament is man-made. 
it's actually all scripture. There's no New or Old Testament, first of all. But let's keep reading. Now, Hebrews 4, let's read and start in verse 8. You can read the whole thing. I'm just going to read this one part. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Okay, now this is in the New Testament. Now what are we going to say? It's still available today because he's the same Lord in the old and in the new. He doesn't change. He's the same from the beginning to the end. Okay, look what it says. For anyone who enters God's rest, which is the kingdom of God, also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. See, we don't want to follow the Israelites' disobedience and have to walk around the desert for the next four years. What that's called today, that's called going through the great tribulation. That's what that's called. See, the bride, the people that we're talking to, the people that are already in now, won't go through the great tribulation. They get taken out. We do a whole other study on that. They're protected. Everyone else that believes in Jesus, but are honoring them, will go through the great tribulation. He is separating his people. Now, it's by choice. You can either choose to be his people, or you can choose to go through the great tribulation. And the choice is yours. And that's an encouraging choice, because we know what we have to do, just honor him. It's really simple. It's not like difficult. Right? So let's keep going. You gotta, so on that line here, you want to write, there remains then a Sabbath day for the people of God. Write that on your line. So there remains then a Sabbath day for the people of God. And the Sabbath is a sign between God and his people. That's what it is. It's a sign. It's a mark between the people of God. If you notice, it doesn't say Israelites anymore. You notice that? They're now called the people of God. Because Jesus came to give everyone the opportunity to be saved. See, before Jesus, it was only the Israelites. But now he gave anyone the opportunity to be saved. So the people of God are different. And you're going to see that here in a second. Let's look at 1 John. Because I've had people say, well, you know, I know the Lord. I know Jesus. I know he's in my heart. Okay, well, let's see what the Bible says about that. <laughs> I just like to look at what the scripture says. We're almost there, guys. Let's look. Um, John 2, starting at verse 3. Look what it says. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Now, that, I'm going to just translate it for you, but if you change that to a different translation, whenever you see the word commands, he's always saying commands. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I have known him, but does not do what he commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. He's a liar. This is the Bible says. But anyone who obeys his word, the love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus said. Let me ask you a question. Does Jesus honor the commandments? Yeah. Yeah. Did he rest on the seventh day? No. no. So what do we have to do? Same thing. No. Well, we don't have to by yeah. choice. Right? Yeah, we, we, we get to honor the seventh day. <laughs> right? Okay. And it's, and it's optional. So look at this. Uh, oh, wait, wait. I'm sorry. Um, the reason I like to do this, just so you know, I'd like to do this because there's a lot of people that watch this online and sometimes they use different translations. So they say, I don't like the NIV or I don't like the King James. Or I don't like okay, well, we'll just translate it so the Bible can say it in whatever translation you like. So let's see it again. It says, um, uh, uh, 2, oops, I'm not going to go on the scripture. First John 2. So let's see what it says this time. By this we know that we are we know him if we keep his commandments. There you go. So see his commandments. Same commandments. He who says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God, perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who abides in him ought to himself also walk as Jesus did. So this is how we know who God's true people are based on the scriptures. It's because of keeping his commandments. And what's the one commandment he's told us to remember? Mm -hmm. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Right? Mm -hmm. See how simple that is? It's not like, God's not trying to trick us here. He's not trying to make this difficult. He made it real simple. It's take commandments, obey them. Right? Remember the fourth one. It's not like this revolutionary trigonometry. Figure out, we've got to figure this out. You see it in the world, it's not difficult. 
Very simple. You understand? You don't need a computer to figure this out. Nothing. You just need a little count of sevens. <coughs> Pretty easy, right? A third grader can learn this. Yeah. God made it that simple, so everyone is without excuse. So on that line, <coughs> excuse me, it says we know him if we keep his commandments, if we obey his word. What does it say? If we obey his word. Uh, something else would say. Oh, but the, truly the love of God is perfected in him. And this is how we know we abide in him. This is how we know it. You get it? He's showing you what it takes to make it. He's telling you right here. He's giving you the prescription to make it to the kingdom of heaven. Right here. And all you have to do is obey the prescription. He's showing it to you. Clear as day. Let's, look, let's, look, let's see if this is, it can be even more simple. Because sometimes, you know, this is a lot of people. I deal with people online. I was dealing with this guy the other day on, on Facebook. And it was pretty unbelievable, I'll tell you, dude. Um, every time he was saying scriptures, he was misquoting scripture, not showing him the scripture, I would just show the scripture. And he just kept arguing scripture about 40 times. And after a while, I said, you know what? Obviously, this message isn't for you. You have a place to take. <laughs> and I just left. I, what else am I going to do? He's just arguing the word of God. It's, it's silly. But let's look at this. John 14. Let, let's see what Jesus says in, in a, the simplest way possible. If you love me, keep my commands. Okay, you see that? This is where people get um, messed up. Let's look at it now in the New King James. New King James. I'm showing you this so you can learn how to study this out with someone. So let's see what, it, see what it says again now. If you love me, what? Keep my commandments. So here's the opposite. There's a law of opposites. If you know what is, you automatically know what isn't. If you don't love me, don't keep my commandments. It's pretty simple. You get it? What's the fourth commandment? Yeah, and which and the Sabbath day is the what? Sign between God and his people. <laughs> you get it? So if you choose not to love him and choose not to obey his Sabbath day, the Bible calls you a liar. And the truth is not in you. It also says that he who does love me will obey the commandments. They're not going to argue and say, oh, that's the of us. We don't need to do that. They'll, they'll honor it. You get it? So let's keep reading, though. Let's look a little further down. Look, he's pretty cool how he says this. Look what it says. At that day, you will know that I am in my, in my Father, and you and me, and I am you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, them, it is he who loves me. He tells you who loves him. See, people think they go do this acts of service. They go to church. They read the Bible, they pray, they, they, they give a tithe, they go give to the poor. There's none of that in here, if you notice that. Now, should we do those things? Yes, those are out of the overflow of the heart. We get to go give to the poor because we love them. No. You understand? We get to go serve the people in Africa and India because we love them. We get to go paint someone's house because we love them. We get to go because we love them. That's not loving him. To him, you know what loving the Lord is to the Lord? Keeping his commandments. You get it? And the one commandment that is the sign between him and his people is remembering the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. This should not even be optional. If someone today came and said, Stephen, I got a billion dollars for you today. I'm going to give you this billion dollars if you'll go work today because I got a job for you today. You know, I'd say, I appreciate that, but we have to work that out tomorrow or later tonight or tomorrow or some other day because I'm not, I don't break the Sabbath day for any of my money. Oh, you wouldn't do it for a billion dollars? No. Would I murder for a million dollars? Would I commit adultery for a million dollars? Would I go, you know, you, you understand? Would I put idols in my house for a million dollars? No, what's the difference between that and breaking the Sabbath day? It's in the same Ten Commandments, isn't it? So from God's perspective, if you break one, you've broken them all. You understand? See how serious this is to God? It's serious. He's separating this people right now. He wants you to be a child of God. Now, that's optional. You don't have to be. But don't expect to get the benefit of it. That's all he's saying. He gives you the free will. So on this line here, it says, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's what you write on that line. So write that down. If you love me, keep my commandments. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, 
is the one who loves me. Write that on the line. The reason I want you to write it so that you could say it. So you can't ever say to the guy, oh, geez, I didn't know about this. He goes, remember that song that we did on the 5th of January? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Remember when you that message and you wrote it down? You wrote it in your own handwriting. Remember that? You're going to have that right next to the book. The book you know. Remember that? I got, I got a copy of it because he emailed me one too. So you, know, I, I, you wrote it. What do you mean you didn't know? You didn't know. <laughs> you just chose not to do it. And he's going to say, I don't know you. Away from you. See, that's the, probably the worst thing you could ever hear. I mean, I'm sure in sports, you guys, the worst thing you could ever hear is, man, you're not on the team with your cut. Huh. Would that be a ter terrible thing, Brandon, to hear? Yeah. No. You, you would love to hear your cut from the team? Oh, yeah, yeah. They'd that, probably be the worst I, I, thing. I mean, that's I mean, not the worst. Yeah, it's probably one of the worst, though, right? Yeah, It'd be horrible, wouldn't it? It'd be a horrible feeling to feel, like, man. <laughs> you think you're a star, you've been thinking you're doing everything right, and God cuts you. That night. See, people say, oh, yeah, but Jesus is grace. He has grace, right? He gives everybody. He loves everyone. But well, didn't he love all the Israelites? But only two went into the Romans, man. <laughs> didn't he love Noah and the whole world at that time? Yeah, he created everybody in the world, but only eight were saved on that boat. And the rest of them went through a flood. You get it? Yeah, he loved the Israelites. Read Deuteronomy 28. He loved them. But for 4,000 years, we've been enslaved. Go look at the jails. Right now, and see who's in them. Go look at the turmoil that, that the true Israelites of the Bible are going through, even to this day. They've been punished by the Lord because of disobedience to the same Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. So this is so important for us. No matter how young we are, we can act like we're young, but if you've been baptized for the forgiveness of your sin, you ain't that young no more. Now it's up to you to make that decision to follow the Lord. So let's keep going. We're only we're almost done here. That, I think two more scriptures. So we're talking about who the Lord is. Who are the who are the body and the chosen people? So we know the Israelites were. But let's see what the Bible says here. Galatians. Galatians 3. Galatians 3. I'm going to put this back on NIV. Galatians 3, starting in verse 20. Let's start in verse 26. It says, so in Christ Jesus, you're all children of God. Remember, now we're still talking about the children of God. Who are these children of God? Well, we know they're obeying the commandments, right? But let's see what else we're doing. You're all children of God through faith. So we have to have faith in the Lord. For all of you who are what? Baptized. Say it again. Baptized. Can everybody say it at once? Baptized. baptized. For all of you who are baptized into Christ. Have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew, nor Gentile, nor slave, nor free, nor is there male or female. For you are all one in Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Amen. So what makes us Abraham's seed is that we are heirs according to the promise if we are baptized. You understand? Mm -hmm. That's how it works. That's how it works. Make sense? Yep. Very important to understand this basic principle. So the children of God are one, their faith. They believe in what the Bible says. They believe in the word of God. Two, they're baptized. They clothe themselves with Christ. They receive forgiveness of sin and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And they are considered Abraham's See, this is the last scripture. Isn't that encouraging to know? Mm -hmm. So we now know. It's easy. You guys are all there. So Revelation. Revelation 22. Revelation 23, starting in verse 14. It says, Blessed are those who wash their robes, One of those translation things. We put it on the New King James. New King James. 14. Look what it says. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. 
Wow. God can't make it more simple for us. We have to become a disciple of Jesus. Mm -hmm. We have to make Jesus our Lord and not have any other gods before him. We have to have faith in his blood that he died on the cross for us and we rose on the third day. We have to make a decision to follow him and die to ourselves. We have to obey his commandments, especially his sign, which is the Sabbath day. And we have to be baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins so we can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then we can enter into the gates of heaven. Amen. Let's end it off in prayer. Father God, I just want to come to you today and thank you so much for this message, God. I just love the way you teach us, God, through your word, Father. You, you teach us what we need to hear. And no matter what age we are, Father, no matter who we are, no matter how we've come, Father, you've given us the roadmap of what it takes to make it to the kingdom of God. And it's a simple map, Father. It's a pretty straight line. It's pretty simple to follow, God. And we just thank you so much for sharing it with us today and teaching this to us. And I pray that the hearts here are excited, encouraged, and we're really taking the heart to be here to honor him as often as they possibly can and on the Sabbath day. We love you. We thank you so much for all the ways you bless our families. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.